Good morning, Damascus Grace Fellowship. How are you all today? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good to see all your faces. I just want to make an announcement. You've heard about the Damascus Fair for several weeks now. And we're coming down to the, the final finish in terms of putting on the the last, or putting together the last items required for uh, the fair that is going to be happening next week, September 6th, 7th, and 8th. The fair has been a tradition here in this community since 1926, and Damascus Church has had a presence there for a number of years, I believe. I don't know how many years they've been doing it before I got involved, but they have had representation there, and we're going to be doing that again this year as part of our outreach to the community. So again, September 6th, 7th, and 8th, uh, we will have a booth, um, and we are in need of volunteers. Thank you to everyone who has already volunteered, but we are still needing folks for Friday evening on the 6th. We need at least one more person for the three-hour block from 6 to 9, Sabbath, Sabbath morning, we don't have anybody, I believe, who's registered or signed up as yet. So Sabbath morning, we do need three volunteers there. And uh, some additional volunteers for the rest of the Sabbath day and for Sunday morning. Uh, there is a updated sign-up sheet at the ministry table. So you can see where there's a need and just put your name down. If you are willing to give of uh, your time a three-hour uh, portion of your weekend next week. Um, this year's fair is sponsored by the 3ABN uh, network. Um, I am a 3ABN ambassador, and I'll have more to share about that in the future, but they have provided a lot of uh, um, ministry um, materials uh, to share on health and wellness, um, several books, uh, children's activity, uh, coloring items, and, and much, much more. So we have a table set up in the fellowship hall that if you want to just walk by, don't touch, but go walk by and just see what it's going to look like. We're going to have a training session that will be um, held here uh, this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m., there will not be prayer meeting, online prayer meeting, but instead we will be having a training session here next Wednesday for the volunteers so that you can see the materials that we are going to be handing out, have an understanding of what it is that we want to share with the 2,500 expected uh, attendees for the fair. So uh, please, again, please make a note of that. Put it on your calendar for those volunteers that have already signed up. Those are, who are curious, then, then just come on Wednesday and learn more about it. Okay? Thank you very much. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So welcome to all of our visitors. We're very happy to have you here and to all of our returning members. Today is a very unique Sabbath day because we get to take control, all of us kids, and with the service today. And it's just so nice to see how far we've come with how many kids are now in our church. So for the Damascus Fair, there are more um, information in your bulletin about the hours and the how much volunteers we need. We have the Potomac Conference Convention, which we are doing on September 21st, and that begins at 11 a.m. And we are gonna have a celebration of life. So join us for that on September 7th at 4.30 to honor the lives of Ben and Janice Copel. The celebration of life will follow the service and we invite you to join us for dinner in the fellowship hall. The Pathfinder Registration Day will be on Sunday, September 8th, 2024, uh, 10 to 12 p.m. And lastly, we have a picnic at Great Falls on Sunday, September 22nd at 11 a.m. Thank you.
Happy Sabbath. Our first song will be Never Give Up. song will be Jesus Loves Me.
Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, please help. I invite this God's spirit into our heart, into into the church. Um, help this speaker to preach well in the Son of Amen. Good morning, church family. As we gather together in worship and fellowship, let's take a moment to reflect on the blessings we've received and the opportunity we have to give back. In Malachi 3.10, the Lord invites us to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in his house. He promises us to open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will, be not, there will not be room enough to store it. Giving is a an act of worship and a beautiful way to express our gratitude for everything God has given us. It's a way to support the work of the church, to reach out to those in need, and to further the kingdom of God. As you prepare your tithes and offerings, I encourage you to give with a joyful heart, knowing that your contributions make a difference. Whether you give in person or online, your generosity is a testament to God's provision and your trust in him. I invite the deacons to come forward. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundant blessing and your faithfulness. As we bring our tithes and offerings today, we do so with grateful hearts. Use these gifts to further your work, to bless those in need, and to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's now time for the children's story. May the children come forward. Here are the baskets. The money that is from the children's offering will go to Adventist education.
Good morning, children. When God asks you to do something, should you do it? What if it may not seem fun to do it? Should you still do it? In a long time ago, in the nation next to Israel called Syria, there was an army commander named Naaman. He was a very good army commander. He was, he was a mighty warrior. But one day, he suffered from leprosy, which was an incurable disease at the time. So, one, so Naaman's serv wife also had a servant, who, a little girl, who was a servant. And the servant girl was an Israelite. So when she heard that Naaman had leprosy, she said, you should... Go, Naaman should go see Elisha the prophet. He will surely help him. So Naaman went to see Elisha the prophet. What do you think is going to ha Elisha would do? Elijah will tell Na Naaman to go to the Damascus River and dip himself in there seven times. Yes, yes, but not exactly. When the when Naaman when uh, when the Naaman came to Elisha's house, Elisha didn't come out of the house. He sent a messenger telling Naaman not to dip in the Damascus River, which was clean, or a uh, or or another river that was clean. He said, "Go dip yourself in the Jordan River, which was pretty muddy." If you were Naaman, would you dip yourself in, the jo in a muddy river? <laughs> well, well, Naaman didn't like that idea. He said, I thought he was going to call on his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Parfar, which are cleaner river rivers, better than the rivers of Israel? Why can't I wash in those rivers? Those are clean rivers. Fortunately, Naaman had servants who told Naaman, Naaman, if the prophet asked you to do something really, really hard, you would do it. So why don't you do, obey, listen to the prophet and go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. So Naaman decided to go f do it. He dipped the first time. Was he healed? He dipped the second time. Was he healed? What about the third and fourth times? What about the fifth and sixth times? Was, what happened after the seventh time? He was healed at the seventh time. Then he went to Elisha and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, who I serve, I will not accept any gifts, for the praises go to God. And afterwards, Naaman believed in God. So when God asks us to do something, even if it's not very fun or may not seem pleasant, it is always for our good. Who wants to pray that we may obey God all the time? God, I will praise you forever. You're so beautiful, loving, and merciful. You're an awesome God. Please help us, the children, to be obedient to you and love you always. Bless our parents, teachers, and family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may, be this, you may go back to your seats. May you please join me in a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today as one body united in faith and love. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your name to worship, to learn, and to grow closer to you. 
Lord, we lift up our hearts in gratitude for your endless grace and mercy. You have blessed us in countless ways, and we are humbled by your goodness. We, are as, we ask for your forgiveness for the times we have fallen short, and we seek your strength to walk in your ways. Father, we pray for our church community. May we be a beacon of your light and love in this world. Help us to support one another, to lift each other up, and to serve with compassion and humility. Guide our leaders with wisdom and discernment as they shepherd your flock. We also bring before you the needs of our world. We, we pray for, your, for peace where there is conflict, healing where there is pain, and hope where there is despair. Use this, Lord, as instruments of your peace and love. As we continue in our service today, open our hearts and minds to your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may be transformed and renewed. May our, may our worship be pleasing to you, and, we, and may we leave this place inspired to live, our, to live out your will in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. It's being sure of what we do not see. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
the tongues of angels and we will sing his praise for no power on earth can stop us the truth will ring bold and clear till it's reached every clime and swept every land and sounded in every ear here are my hands to Good morning, church. Today, I'm going to talk about a very important topic, what to do when your faith is low. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to have freedom to preach openly and not privately. And we are able to understand your word and just be with us today and help us to Learn more today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, what is faith and why is it important? We all know the definition given by Paul in Hebrews 11 verses one that says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But on a simple level, to really understand faith, you need three things. The first of the three is a desire, a need, or a problem. Then number two is a promise, and the third is to take action. Let me explain this better by telling you a story. Two years ago, I had the flu, and we all know that it isn't a fun experience. You can have back pain, joint pains, nausea, fevers, and so much not fun stuff. So it turned out that year that back pain decided to attack me, and and I had to, I felt so bad that I had to take something to ease the pain, which was, you know, a painkiller. But the way I knew about it, the promise of the, you know, relief was through marketing, you know, through the marketing of the pharmaceutical companies who said, hey, when you take this, it makes you feel better. And so when I was able to take that, and I was able to achieve the outcome I hadn't achieved in you know, a while. So for you to have a faith, you need a communicated promise. Now let's turn our Bibles to Romans 10, 13 through 15. Romans 10, 13 through 15. Say amen when you're there. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So we see here that there are two promises that God has given us. So the first one comes from Romans 10, 13, where Paul is quoting Joel, where he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And that means that, that whenever we need God, he is there for us. And the second comes from verse 15, and that one means that, you know, where he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So he says here that he, God will bless us if we preach and, you know, teach for him. Do you know someone who is sick? Now in Bible times, there was a woman who was sick with the issue of blood for 12 years. She had gone to all the doctors who had made her have faith in their faith, in their remedies. But instead of getting better, she had gotten worse. But then she heard about a solution, a promise. Someone had told her about Jesus and how he could heal sickness. And so, because she believed the promise that she could get better, she went out in faith, and the rest is history. So now, why is it important to have faith in God? Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, is it impossible to please him, which is God? For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. To explain this better, let me tell you some stories. The first one comes from Mark 6. Jesus left, had left where he was preaching and decided to go to Nazareth. He went to the synagogue and began to teach. And people began to become astonished and they were like, where did he get this wisdom? Isn't he Mary's son? But Jesus, then Jesus said to them, a prophet is not welcome among his friends and family. And because the people of Nazareth decided to doubt Jesus, he couldn't really do any work there. Now the second story comes from Mark 2. This time, Jesus was in Capernaum, and after a couple of days, word got around that Jesus was in town. And when they found out that he was staying at a specific house, the people immediately flocked there. And Jesus, as usual, preached to them the word of God. And as he was preaching and healing, there came a paralytic man with four of his friends carrying him on a bed. When they realized that they could not get in through the door, they were unfazed. They just went up to the roof and because they had so much faith, ripped out the roof and lowered him to Jesus. And when Jesus had saw how much faith the man had, they sa he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And you know that saying something like that would rouse the anger of the religious leaders toward Jesus. And they said to themselves, who can forgive sins but God alone? And when Jesus saw their expressions, he could tell that they were think what they were thinking and said, why do you argue about these things in your hearts? Which one is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, or to get up, pick up, pick up your bed, and walk? And then Jesus said, so that you can know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic man, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately, the paralytic man got up, picked up the bed, left with all the people amazed and glorifying God, saying, we have never seen stuff like this. And so, because of the faith of the paralytic man, we now have an exciting story of faith. And now the third story comes from Mark 9. And when Jesus, James, and John had returned to the other disciples, they found a crowd waiting for them. The disciples were arguing with some scribes. And as soon as the crowd saw Jesus, the crowd ran toward him. A man from the crowd explains that his son is possessed by a mute spirit that causes him to have violent seizures and throw him into the fire or water. Jesus told the man to bring his son to him. When the boy was brought, the spirit immediately threw him into a convulsion, causing the foam at the mouth 
and become rigid. Jesus asked the father how long this had been happening for, and the father replied that it had been going on for since childhood. Then he, uh, he then asked Jesus to have compassion and help if he could. Jesus responded that everything is possible for those who believe. The father immediately cried out that he believed, but also told, asked Jesus to help him with his belief. Jesus then rebuked the unclean spirit com and commanding it to come out and never return the, to the boy again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed the boy violently, and came out, leaving the boy appearing dead. But when Jesus took the boy by the hand and held him up, the boy was restored. It is, <clears throat> so we see here that, that having faith, even if it's not important, I mean, not fit perfect, is really important. For facing big challenges, the boy's father believes in Jesus, but admits that he has doubts. Jesus shows that even a small bit of faith can make a big difference. So even if our faith, even if our faith is not strong, we can still have miracles done for us. Let's turn our Bible to Jeremiah 7, chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs 28, 26. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. So we see here that the problem is sin, and what's even bigger is that it's in our hearts and minds. We all have a heart problem, and we can't change by ourselves. Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also, who are accustomed to do evil, There is a problem solution, promise solution. Let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel 36, verses 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Let's turn our Bibles now to John 3, verses 5. John 3, verses 5. And it says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus here is talking to Nicodemus, who showed his faith through who showed his faith through coming to Jesus at night, even though it had risks that he could lose his job permanently and become very, very poor, because he was a rich man. And so it shows his faith as it is growing and getting larger and larger.
Now let's read verses 14 through 18 of John 3, verses 5. As, and as Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, but whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who do, does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So we see here that the solution is to be born again. Let's, now let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 8, verses 10. Hebrews 8, verses 10. Hebrews 8, verses 10. For this is the covenant I will make with thee, with, with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put the, my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Is your faith to low, to the, low today? If so, sin is the problem. But the good news is that there is a promise. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, sorry, 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust If you are struggling with faith in God, it might be because of your view of God is obscure. Let's read Isaiah 26, verses 23. Isaiah 26, verses 23. Isaiah 26, which is 23. Wait a sec. I don't see it, so let me just skip over it. Okay, so let's go back to first, second Peter, sorry, one verses two to four, and then we'll read that again. Here we go. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him who have called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises through which you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The promises give us faith. Grace and peace comes from knowing God. Faith comes from knowing God. 
Let's turn our Bibles to, to Romans 10, verses 17. Romans 10, verses 17. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If your faith is low, it's time to read the review section of the Bible. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 11. We're going to start at verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now let's go to skip over verse 7. Let's go to verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the, out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and hears with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now let us go to verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did, did not perish for, with those who did not believe when she had received the spies of peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through righteousness obtained promises, stopped the, the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight, fly, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. The women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial of mocking, mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Reflecting on the lives of Enoch, Abraham, and Rahab, we see how their unwavering faith in the midst of un un uncertainty, uncertainty served as a beacon of hope. In conclusion, when our faith is low, remember that God's presence and promises remain unwavering. By turning to prayer, the Bible, and other things that are Christian and help us to bolster, bolster our faith, we can find renewed strength and hope. As we go deep into these life-changing practices, we invite God to revive our faith and guide us through our times of doubt. The ultimate goal is to come out with a faith in God that is not only revived, but fortified, ready to face the challenges ahead with renewed faith in God. Let us trust in God's everlasting faithfulness, knowing that in our weakest moments, his strength is made perfect. Amen.
Please stand for our closing song, We Have This Hope. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you allowed me to become a beacon of light to others who are, have low faith. And please help them to go and do what, what you say and help them to renew their faith and just be with them and help them with through their struggles. In Jesus' name, amen.